John, John Fraser. I've uh, read John Fraser in various forms and in various publications, uh, his books, his columns. Uh, I recently uh, was invited to uh, see his apartment. He's the master of Massey College, which is an interesting, wonderful piece of architecture in and of itself, and thank you for that visit. Uh, but mostly, I dig John Fraser um, because he is a great raconteur, and he had the cojones to take on Jan Wong. <laughs> I must say, it is a real thrill to be up here after uh, two of the most wonderful young musicians I've ever heard, after the most impassioned political rhetoric I've heard in 10 years, and after the funniest lawyer in captivity. It's just a thrill to be <laughs> alone on this stage in my hemp suit from China. <laughs> and, that's my segue to China, because that's, that's what I want to talk about. I have a, a, a Chinese past, not entirely with Jan Wong. It's a Chinese past with, with having been sent to China by the Globe and Mail 20, 25 years ago to be their correspondent after being their ballet critic. It, there, was some, <laughs> there was some sense that the editor had read Evelyn Waugh's novel, Scoop, if you recall. It's when Excuse me, someone want to answer the phone? Okay. Um, personal peeve. Um, it, the editor had read uh, Scoop, where the gardening columnist got sent by mistake to cover an East African war, and I was sent as the ballet critic to China. Um, the first thing when you start reading China is you, you, about China is you get terrified by figures, and that's how I want to start, because I'm trying to lead up to explain uh, why one of the most uh, interesting countries that have ever been on this earth, why the government of a fifth of the population goes berserk over a tiny self-help group called Falun Gong. That's what I'm trying to do. Falun Gong is the idea, and I'm trying to understand and trying to explain, as I understand, why uh, it has so upset this extraordinary country and government. But uh, the first thing you have to learn when you make any effort on China is not to be terrified by figures. Figures in China uh, come thrusting out at you in everything you read. For example, uh, Chairman Mao once said that 95% uh, uh, of the Chinese people were, were good people, solid citizens, and uh, even if they weren't members of the Communist Party of China, nevertheless they supported China, the Communist Party's historic challenge to redeem the Chinese people from the humiliations of the previous two centuries, and only 5% were bad. And that sounds pretty generous until you realize that in China, 5% is somewhere around 50 million people, twice the population of our own dear land, and uh, the whole excuse for this network of labor reform <coughs> camps and prisons. Um, figures can even be funny. Um, in the Cultural Revolution, when uh, the only friend China had in the world, the only official friend was the tiny uh, country of Albania with its two million stalwart citizens and its uh, totally berserk leader, Enver Hodja, who ruled uh, almost as long as the Ontario Conservative Party ruled this province. Um, Zhou Enlai made his final trip uh, to uh, outside of China to Tirana, the capital of Albania, on May Day. And this was when China's population was officially pegged at 700 million. And Enver Hodja summoned Albania to his red square. They could, they could pretty well put half of it, the whole population of the country, in this one square. And he rang them for two hours. And uh, towards the height of his rhetoric, he turned around, he grabbed Zhou Enlai by the hand, pulled him up to the rostrum, and said, we are invincible. We are 702 million strong. a man with a big idea. <laughs> so, if you go back from that moment of 702 million strong, back to the Long March, one of the most glorious moments in Chinese Communist Party history, when the Chairman Mao 
was uh, in danger of being destroyed uh, by the Guomindang government of Chiang Kai-shek and was forced to flee the one safe area he'd found in the south of China and to take uh, his followers through a long uh, thousand, thousand kilometer uh, march that killed about half the people that were on it and arrived in, in a semi-safe area just before the Japanese invasion with less than 30,000 followers. From that, they took over the, uh, the governance after civil war of the most populous nation on earth with the longest continuous cultural history. My own uh, uh, tiny little speck of an appearance on the Chinese horizon happened in 1977 when the Globe sent me there. And uh, I was frankly almost as terrified as I am up here. Uh, and I didn't, uh, I didn't quite know how to go about connecting with people. The one thing I had going for me was I did want to connect. And I didn't realize at the time, but it set me ahead of most of the journalists who were then posted in the city and most of the diplomats. That was partly because it was impossible to have any direct connection with Chinese people in those years. The Cultural Revolution was coming to its end. It wouldn't have been worth any Chinese person's um, skin to make a, a, a friendship with, with a foreign journalist. They, just going beyond a simple hello or, or uh, a friendly smile uh, would, would have got them at the very least uh, questioning from anyone who reported them. So how to, how to connect was a problem. And as luck would have it, a young Irish anthropologist named Hugh Brody, perhaps some of you have read his book, Maps and Dreams, and he's had a recent, recent book on northern peoples. He happened to be visiting a girlfriend in, Beijing, uh, who we had a connection to, and she asked if we'd put him up in our house. This man had never uh, been to China before. He'd never been to Asia. He'd been with nomadic peoples, though. He'd been up in the Canadian Arctic and up in, up in the Scandinavian Arctic. And uh, he arrived late at night. We put him to bed. He woke up in the morning, and he said to me, uh, the resident correspondent, well, let's go out and meet the people. And I looked at him, and he just thought he was a raving lunatic. And I thought, well, this might be fun to watch. So out we went. <laughs> and we walked out of our guarded compound where the People's Liberation Army had a sentry post. We walked, kept walking the block. He'd never, he'd never seen this in daylight. And we got to a bus stop, and he stopped. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, we're going to get on the bus. Have you got any money? And I, I said, I've got money. I've, what are you gonna, I don't know where this bus goes. I've never been on a bus in China. I have a, a driver in a car. And uh, he said, well, let's get on the bus. So a bus came down, and there was a crowd of people, and we got on the bus. And uh, when we got on, they, they wouldn't even take our money. This was, everyone uh, thought it was quite wonderful. We were on the bus. And uh, people got up and gave us seats. Old ladies got up and gave us seats. <laughs> and uh, we sat down, and, and uh, Hugh smiled, and he, he loved physical contact. And it was winter, so we were in great coats, and so you could, you could feel the press of bodies, and you could smell China, and it was, all, it was all happening, except we suddenly made a left turn, and I hadn't a clue where we were heading to. And I particularly didn't know how we were going to get back, and it, I think I was, came out of my mother's womb wondering, how do I get back? Um, I always want to know where the exit is. That's rather typical of journalists. We want to be at the center of things, but have a safe exit out. And um, uh, we were gone for about 20 minutes, and I turned to Hugh, and I said, um, I, don't, I don't know if taxis come out this far. And he said, it doesn't matter. We'll just go to the end of the line, and they'll either let us come back, or we'll just start walking. Someone will look after us. And we went to the end of the line, and we got out, and we started walking, and another bus came, and we went on that. I didn't speak very much Chinese at that point. In fact, by the time I left, uh, I had only learned enough Chinese to get into trouble, not enough quite to get out of it. And, but after about three hours, um, Hugh, who spoke uh, no, no words of Chinese, just went like this to, uh, in front of, a, in front of a, a, a police station that we'd come to. He just put his arms out and he said, help! <laughs> People clustered all around us. The, the numbers are extraordinary. I, I remember Margie Gillis, uh, the modern dancer, came to Beijing that next summer, 
And uh, she, she came and told me that she went to Jitan Park, the Temple of the Rising Sun, and she, she said, it was just an amazing experience. I've never had anything like this happen to me before. I just took off my, my clothes down to my dance outfit, and suddenly there were a thousand people around me. I didn't know how to explain to her that if she just stood still and, and picked her nose, she'd have 500. <laughs> but, and then she danced, and she had about 5,000. So, so that was, that was, that was uh, uh, the way it was in those days when there were so few foreigners. But Hugh Brody taught me this extraordinary thing that you could go and do what you want in China until perhaps a bayonet was aimed at your ribs and then it was perhaps best to stop. <laughs> and, and, and the dilemma in those far off days, as I think it is still today in reporting on a country like China, is to make the differentiation between the extraordinary people and the system that they live under. And uh, the, the, the reservoir of goodwill that the Communist Party of China built up in the, in the, pre, in the, in the pre-Civil War period, in, 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 in defending the cause of the peasants, in, in being the major force that pushed the Japanese invaders out of the country, in, in, um, in correcting a 200-year uh, uh, slur on the, on the independence of China with the treaty ports and the, and the foreign incursions. All that credit that went in the bank and which they were able to draw on through, I can't tell you how many stupid ideological campaigns uh, throughout the 50s and the 60s and even the, the, the horrendous uh, trauma that China was put through in the Cultural Revolution. There was still credit in the bank that was that strong up until uh, the Tiananmen tragedy in 1989. And it was that tragedy that ended, ended all of, of the credit that that party had. The only thing it had left after Tiananmen in order to, to uh, uh, control and keep its position as the, as the, as the government was, was force and also a certain a certain uh, grudging acknowledgement that it could defend China's national interests. Um, and you see that uh, whenever an American president bombs one of their embassies or, or a plane crashes over Taiwan, you can see that aspect come into play. But what they lost was something major. They lost a spiritual hold on the Chinese people. They killed the brightest and the best of their young people. They just killed them and uh, uh, they didn't know how to deal with it. And that's what, that's what went down with the blood uh, in Tiananmen, was, was the, the, last, the last vestige that the Chinese Communist Party had over the, the spiritual ambitions of the great Chinese people. And in its wake, um, ideas began circulating, all sorts of things uh, uh, of really a, a metaphysical nature um, began circulating and one of them was Falun Gong, which um, I don't know how best to describe it in, in, in Western parallel terms. It's, it's, like, it's, like, uh, it's like Dale Carnegie with Tai Chi, or, or um, it's self-improvement. It's, it's, a, it's a modest uh, cult. It's got certain kinds of exercises which can be differentiated from the Tai Chi ones that you see in the parks. There, there are... Um, there are uh, bodies of principles to go over in your head to, uh, to uh, help you think better and, and, and uh, think more clearly. Um, and it, it, it asks for a certain kind of uh, consistency in your, in your behavior. Now, why that should cause the persecution that's going on in China now, and it's very, very real persecution. Um, there are people who have been executed. Um, there are thousands of people in prison. Um, there are uh, uh, millions of followers who are, who are just quietly, um, quietly practicing, hidden away, terrified what's going on. Um, why, why should uh, such a powerful government, such a powerful state apparatus be so terrified? And it can, only, it can only be because it has no faith in its own ability to appeal to the people and because it, is, it knows better 
than any other institution on God's earth what a small group of people can do to take over a country because they were that group. They were the Falun Gong of their day. And so uh, when we look at it mystified, uh, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like attacking the, the people that follow Tony Robbins or whatever his name is. Um, why, why, why would you do that? It's because we, we, don't, we, don't, we can't equate. Um, I was very moved by the, by the marijuana speech because I'm not comfortable thinking of my own country um, persecuting people uh, on any scale. And, and I, haven't, I, I haven't adjusted to that speech yet. I'm still taking that in. But uh, when I was in China a month ago, I tried to write Falun Gong on the internet to send the story back to the post and the machine closed down somehow. I don't know how, I don't understand computers, but I, I couldn't write it. Um, it. It was in a hotel and there were instructions which told me um, that I was not to misuse the machine and I had to expect penalties if I did. So uh, um, I used funny little uh, words that, that indicate it and it, uh, it was a sadness because it was up against all the dynamism that New China is trying to produce. And everywhere I went, every city was haunted, haunted by this persecution. It's an idea, uh, it's an idea that is killing people. And that's a somber way to follow Eddie Greenspan, but that's what I'm gonna leave you with. Thank you.